pipeline happens in a stage. There's nothing running outside of stages. Uh, this will work better with uh, visualization, uh, including the existing stage view plugin and the uh, in beta for a little bit longer Blue Ocean uh, UI for Jenkins. It's easier to look at any declarative pipeline and understand what it's doing uh, than it is with uh, a structured pipeline. Just as looking at any kind of configuration file is easier than looking at an arbitrary bash script uh, because it's following certain rules, it's more like configuration. Uh, the structure also enables round tripping with the visual editor, which has uh, got a beta coming out on Monday, more detail on that later. And the whole thing has been built with, uh, with and for Blue Ocean visualization. So we've got uh, markings in Blue Ocean for stages that are skipped due to a failure in an earlier stage, for stages that are skipped because uh, you can decided to conditionally not execute it. So we've got a predictable execution model and better uh, visualization of that execution model. Now, uh, the error reporting, which is one of the things I have had the most fun working on. One of the biggest frustrations I've had with Pipeline is running an hour-long build and then discovering 55 minutes into it that I have a typo in a variable name or a parameter name and the whole thing barfs out. There's, there's no way for me to know ahead of time without executing it whether uh, I actually have the right syntax, have the right uh, parameter types, etc. Declarative does syntax and validation checking before uh, actually executing the build. It's the very, very beginning of the build. It goes through, make sure the syntax looks right, make sure that uh, we've got the right uh, uh, types on all of our steps, uh, make sure that we're not doing something completely insane, uh, and errors out at that time, uh, the very, very beginning of the build, with errors that are reported as compilation errors, pointing to exactly where the error was, telling you what the error was, giving you suggestions for what you might have meant if you had a typo in a parameter name or something like that. Uh, and through this, we're able to eliminate many of the potentially confusing stack traces that Pipeline can give you when things go wrong. Not all of them. There are still some that can sneak through. But uh, I think a lot of the most commonly encountered and mystifying stack traces now instead will give you a clear error message about what's wrong in the, your definition of your Pipeline rather than, again, waiting until the end of the build and saying, oh, yeah, something went wrong. Um, and yeah, we validate syntax, we make sure we've got required configuration, we make sure step parameter types match up, uh, and more. So an important thing uh, to touch on with declarative pipeline is, is what this means for scripted pipeline. In practice, it doesn't mean anything. Both still exist. De uh, declarative pipeline is very much built on top of scripted pipeline. It's not a separate uh, thing. It's a new syntax for pipeline. Uh, and we're now calling traditional pipeline scripted pipeline uh, so that you can distinguish between the two and understand their roles. Uh, the visualizations like Blue Ocean and Stage View don't see any difference between uh, a, uh, a run of a declarative pipeline versus a run of a scripted pipeline because they're all still just generating stages and running steps within stages. Uh, so it's not, uh, not a different thing. It's still the same execution engine. It's a different way to use that execution engine. And scripted pipeline is still used inside declarative pipeline. Uh, all of your step invocations, uh, you're still using those. There's still uh, escape patches where you can use uh, a more, the, the full set of scripted pipeline syntax uh, without validation. Uh, and you can always copy the, uh, the, your steps and contents from a declarative uh, stage into a scripted pipeline and they'll work just fine. It's a subset of the scripted pipeline syntax. So declarative isn't meant to cover absolutely every use case that scripted pipeline does. It's meant to cover 
a lot of them. The ones that are fairly standard, that are fairly uh, predictable, fairly consistent. And when you need to go beyond that, when you've got more complex logic, uh, or you just can't quite fit it in declarative, that's when you move on to scripted. Uh, so why did we write declarative pipelines? So first of all, we've got the reasons why we think everyone should be using pipeline. It's the future of Jenkins. It's also the present of Jenkins now. Uh, pipeline gives you durability so that your builds can uh, continue despite a master restart or a disconnect between the agent and the master. Gives you pipeline as code, the Jenkins file, the ability to have your Jenkins build definition checked into source control, versioned in source control alongside the rest of your code. Uh, Pipeline has a much more modern backend implementation uh, in the Jenkins internals than the traditional freestyle builds do, which gives us a lot more uh, potential for improvements and optimizations going forward. And Pipeline is more powerful and it's more flexible than traditional Jenkins jobs. Uh, there was a great blog post that just went up uh, last week, I think, on uh, conditional build steps uh, and how you can replace those in pipeline without jumping through quite the same weird hoops to put conditionality in a traditional Jenkins freestyle job. So the way we see declarative, the reason for declarative is we want to have benefits for both new users of pipeline and existing users of pipeline. I'm going to touch on the new user reasons first, and I think these don't just apply to new users, but to they're, they're particularly relevant there. Declarative has a lower barrier of entry than scripted pipelines. It's not just throwing you at a blank text editor and saying, here, write a groovy script to run my build. It has a, sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, it has a predictable, well-defined, and documented syntax that can tell you what you need to do, uh, how to do it, etc. And as I mentioned, there's the upcoming UI editor so that you'll be able to actually go to Jenkins, write your job through the editor, it'll save down into a Jenkins file and round trip, et cetera, so that you can get started without having to even touch the Jenkins file by hand. We're not quite there yet with the editor, but we will be soon. Uh, declarative is more human readable. Again, I said that it's more of a configuration feel than a script feel. Uh, and while not saying configuration files are necessarily easy to read, they tend to be easier to read than scripts. Um, declarative does not require groovy specific expertise. Now, I don't think that, pipe, that scripted pipeline necessarily requires a lot of groovy specific expertise either, but it can feel that way. And when you get into more complicated things, it can be that way. So we wanted to make sure people didn't get intimidated by having to think they need to learn a new language or write scripts in something they're not comfortable with just to run their build. Um, so we think that declarative is a better experience for someone who's just getting started with pipelines and for someone who's not, uh, not writing a ton of them or it's just part of their uh, job. And well, we hope that uh, people will find that to be the case. Now, while declarative is uh, in large part directed at uh, uh, the kind of newer or more casual users, we do think it will be really useful for the more uh, advanced or existing users. Uh, since declarative is using the same engine as scripted, your existing investments in shared libraries uh, and the like still apply. There's uh, not a case where you have to start over and learn a completely new thing. You don't have to throw out all the work you've done just to uh, switch over to using declarative. And by expanding the usage and usability, we're putting less burden on the Jenkins domain experts in a shop. It's not like, we want to make it so that uh, you don't end up having to have one or two people who are the people who know how to write Jenkins jobs, and so everybody else has to go through them to write a Jenkins job. Uh, so it should hopefully lower the burden on the experts and empower everybody else more. Uh, 
Again, since we're moving to this more configuration syntax, we think that that's going to make collaboration and code review easier. Uh, uh, one thing, the, the error reporting I mentioned doesn't just work at the, uh, isn't just available at the beginning of the build. There's uh, also a CLI command and more to come to uh, run that linting or validation against a Jenkins file without even having to run a build. So you can get a faster feedback loop on whether you've actually written a valid Jenkins file. And we also think there's a real value in separation of the Jenkins infrastructure related configuration, like what are my agent names, like uh, what tools do I need installed from the step execution so that you don't have the configuration interwoven with the build steps so that you can more easily see, oh, this is the stuff that uh, I need to change when I'm copying it over to a new master or uh, I can go as an admin, go change uh, the you know, label everywhere, but I don't have to worry about, oh, but somewhere deep in the steps of this one build, maybe they do something different with it. Uh, we think that that uh, separation is going to lead to easier maintainability and easier scaling. So now let's uh, do a walkthrough of the syntax. Uh, hold on one sec. Uh, need to make sure my presenter notes show up. Uh, you can't read this, so we're going to move on. Uh, it's just an example of scripted pipeline and declarative pipeline. Don't worry, there's a lot better uh, visualization later. I just wanted to keep this so I could make a point that it's not necessarily the case that declarative is going to be shorter for all of the uh, pipelines in terms of text. You know, the scripted pipeline is shorter than the declarative pipeline. Declarative pipeline is a little verbose at times because we believe that the verbosity provides more information, makes it easier to understand and use. And thought that was, that the problem is not necessarily that the pipeline could get too long, it's that the pipeline could get too confusing. So now we'll actually start looking at the syntax. Uh, I will find some way to get links to the uh, examples I've got here, uh, but for now, so the first thing that's relevant is that right there, the pipeline block. Everything in uh, declarative goes within a, pipe, a block called pipeline. And if it's not in there, declarative doesn't care about it. Uh, so it's, we've got our own syntax within that that's not executed exactly the same way as scripted pipeline. Then the first thing we've got after that is declaring the agent that our job is going to run on. And here we're saying that we want to run on in a Docker container, we give the image name, and uh, declarative will automatically say, okay, they didn't say what label they want to run on, they can run anywhere. And you can specify the label, but you don't have to. And it will fetch the container image, uh, it will run the container, and it will run the rest of the build within that container. So it's a uh, simpler way to be able to specify the configuration for your agents, and can be overridden uh, per stage, not just at the top level. Uh, there's other options for agent besides just Docker, obviously. There's label, uh, there's Docker file, in which case it uh, builds a Docker file from your repository and runs inside the resulting container. Uh, and there's also some magic shortcuts for uh, saying don't run on any agent for some weird edge cases or run on any agent. But in general, I think that you'll figure that out. And plus we've got docs. Um, options uh, contains a few different things at the back end, but what you could think about it is uh, for options for your pipeline that would apply across your entire pipeline. So here we're setting the build discarder job property to make sure that uh, after five, you know, when we run our sixth build, the first build gets deleted, etc. And timeout here is the timeout step that wraps the entire build. And if the build takes more than 30 minutes, it will get killed and reported as having timed out. So when we need to do things that are not just applying to a, a part of the build, but for everything, those show up in options. Parameters are traditional job parameters. Uh, we've pulled them into their own section here so that it's a little more clear than the way it is in scripted pipeline. 
Uh, so string, Boolean, param, various mm -hmm. things. Uh, don't think we need to go into a lot of detail there. Uh, the one thing worth noting is that in current versions of Jenkins from uh, 2.17 onward, there's a params variable in your scripted pipelines or declarative pipelines that will uh, no, use the default value uh, if you haven't already specified the, pipe, the, the parameters, so you don't have to run the build once and then run it again to make sure it doesn't error out. You still just get the default value on that first run, but at least it doesn't error, so that's something nice. Uh, the next key part, and probably, I mean, the bulk of declarative is stages. You put all of your stages inside the stages block. It's uh, at least one and as many more as you want. Uh, each stage takes a name, and then I, it can take some configuration that we'll take a look at later, and then a block of steps to execute. And so each of these chunks of steps are executed in that stage. They'll show up in the visualization uh, in Blue Ocean, so you can see how long that particular chunk took, what the results were from that particular stage. Uh, it's organization is a good thing, having a better sense of uh, the individual parts of your build is a good thing, and so we're enforcing that by requiring that everything be in a stage. Uh, I mentioned that uh, try-catch uh, isn't needed to make sure you send an email at the end of the build. That's another thing that really annoyed me about scripted pipeline is that y if your build fails because a command fails or anything really, unless you've wrapped that uh, failure, that, that section of code that could fail with a try-catch or pipeline's own catch error step, the build will just stop when it gets to the error and will never actually clean up afterwards or send an email to let you know it broke, etc. So we have the post section. Now the post section actually is available both for the entire build and for individual stages. It checks to see whether the current build status matches a condition. Uh, so always meaning it always runs regardless of what the build status is. And then we've also got success, unstable, failure. There's also changed in case the, the build status is changed from the previous build. Uh, and this is an extension point so we can add more conditions going forward. So no matter what, when the build ends, we're going to gather the JUnit tests, uh, JUnit test results and report on them. If the build's successful, we'll get an email saying, hey, the build succeeded. Unstable. We'll be notified there's test failures, failure, that there's build failures. Now, this is a fairly simplistic example, uh, but uh, here we're, we've attached this just to this specific stage. So we're going to get these emails based on the results of this one stage, not necessarily the whole build. Uh, so you may not be wanting to necessarily send emails at the result of one stage, but you may want to, again, check for you know, archive unit test results, even if the build failed, uh, like on a uh, find bugs check that comes after the unit test run or something like that. Uh, you may need to do cleanup uh, if you're running a more complicated integration test or something like that where you want to make sure the machine gets back into a pristine state before you run the next build. Uh, now we have another stage here that has the when condition. When is uh, evaluate to determine whether we're going to execute the stage. The example I have here is using one of the built-in conditions. Uh, we're adding more there as well. The built-in condition here is branch. If the branch that we're on currently matches the pattern that we've given it, in this case master, then we're going to publish our artifacts to S3. If we're on a pull request branch or a feature branch or something like that, well, we're not deploying it, we're not going live with it, so we're not going to publish to S3. Uh, so we've got that conditionality that, in what I think is an easier way than we've had previously. Uh, there's uh, also one that looks, a condition that looks to see whether an environment variable is set to a specific value, and one that allows you to write uh, a pipeline expression that should return a Boolean, ideally, so you can do more complicated logic uh, for your when check, you know, is, is it noon? You know, is it afternoon or is it the morning? For some reason, you might actually care about that. Uh, and then here we've got a step invocation using the kind of ugly meta step syntax 
I just wanted to show that that actually can be done, that, that you're not just limited to the more uh, aesthetically ple pleasing and simple steps, the legacy older steps that haven't updated to have the better syntax throughout all of pipeline can still be used within declarative. Now we've got our final stage, which uh, also is only running when we're on master. Uh, and in this case, we're using something that's coming from a shared library uh, to show I mean, there is no actual step called with tower. That's somebody, somebody wrote for an example. Uh, and, but it's still, if you've got your shared libraries and you've got them available, you can use them within the steps in declarative just as you can in scripted. They work just fine. The validation still can be used to some extent. And you can nest step, uh, steps when you've got block scope steps that say, okay, everything within this block runs with access to tower and with the credentials for tower. Uh, and now, da, 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 the next example. Uh, so here, we're just using a label. Uh, we're just saying run on any agent that has the Docker agents label on it. Uh, we're taking advantage of a nifty trick with the environment section where you can set environment variables that will be available throughout the build. But what we're doing here is using a special function that's available in declarative to take the ID uh, of credentials that you've configured in Jenkins and automatically put them into an environment variable that you can then use later on. So this is a shortcut to make sure you don't have to jump through as many hoops using the with credentials step uh, to make those uh, environment variables populated so you can actually have access to your credentials throughout the build. Uh, another section we've got here, uh, or directive we've got here, is the tools directive. Uh, this, if you've used uh, Maven or JDKs or NPM or a number of other tools in Jenkins, you may have encountered that they can auto install uh, onto, if you've configured them on the master, you can auto install them on the agents. You don't have to make sure they're already installed, et cetera. And what we have here is a nice simple syntax for uh, making sure that those tools get installed onto the agent before we run. Saying, give me a Maven tool with this configured version, give me a, J a JDK tool with this configured version. An important thing to note here is that the tools syntax, the tools uh, directive, and tools installer doesn't actually work on Docker containers. I'm working on that. That's a limitation in pipeline in general, and I am working on that. Uh, but if you're running on just straight agents, this will work for you out of the box. Um, yeah, this one's just a simple stage, but I wanted to have a, an example that actually seemed kind of realistic. So I wanted to make sure that I was actually running steps. And here we're running two steps. You can run as many steps as you want. I have a tendency to have my examples tend to be just one step. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I showed, yes, you can do more than one step. Uh, I know that may have been obvious, but I was afraid it wouldn't be. Uh, next step, tests. So here we're showing... Uh, per stage configuration, and specifically per stage configuration of agent. So our first step that ran uh, make clean and make package and generated our build artifacts uh, was running on just the agent load. Uh, and now we want to run tests, but we want to run those inside a Docker container. So we've specified the image that we're going to build in, and we've specified reuse node true. What that means is that the, this stage's agent will run on the same uh, agent that the previous stage ran on. We'll have access to the workspace and the checkout and the artifacts we already built. So we don't have to worry about copying them around, et cetera. Everything's already available. So that we would then run our you know, uh, shell step to actually do the deploy using that environment variable that we defined before with the credentials. Uh, it's got access to the artifacts and has everything it needs to deploy without having to worry about stashing them between stages, etc. Um, the reuse node field doesn't mean anything at the top level because there's no previous node to use, but it's a handy trick for Docker and Docker files so that you don't have to check things out twice. You don't have to build things twice. You don't have to copy your artifacts around. Uh, and so 
Those are uh, the two examples. So let's talk a little bit about the validation. Like I said, this is my baby in this, is my favorite part, because uh, I've gotten so annoyed at error reporting in, in scripted pipelines and then the lack of easy visibility into what I did wrong, because I do a lot wrong. Uh, the first thing is, as I said, it always happens at the beginning of a pipeline build. When your declarative pipeline build starts, uh, it compiles and validates and makes sure that your syntax is actually right. And not just in the sense that the Groovy script can compile, because getting a Groovy, a compilable Groovy script is not very hard. Um, you can have very broken Groovy that can still compile. Uh, but once we're in that phase, we're looking, we start doing the validation. We look to see, okay, if you've got, uh, did you have a stage? Because if you don't have a stage, what's the point? We're going to error out on you. Uh, did you supply uh, an agent name, an agent type that, that's actually existing and that's available on this master? Because if you try to do agent banana, there's no agent implementation for banana. It doesn't know what that is. It should tell you that ahead of time and say, well, did you mean one of these? And it will. And it'll do the same thing for parameters. If you give it a, uh, an agent uh, the wrong parameter, if you give a step the wrong parameter that doesn't exist, or uh, you have the wrong type, it's going to tell you that uh, so that you can know ahead of time, oh, right, that's what I need to go fix. And the errors point to the problem areas with line and column number uh, with uh, what I hope is a useful uh, and internationalized, though not yet localized, error message, uh, hopefully with suggestions to point you in the right direction. So uh, my apologies for this text size, but yeah. Uh, so here I got an error saying invalidated parameter uint, did you mean unit? Because I did the timeout step and I got time right, that's, that's an existing uh, thing. 15 is the right type. Uint minutes. Wait, no, uint, no, I meant unit. Okay. So it's telling me what I did wrong, where I did wrong, and giving me an idea of how to make it right. Next here, I'm calling the sleep step, but instead of giving it a number, I'm giving it a string. And that's not a valid parameter type. You can't really tell something to sleep for, quote, 10 minutes, unquote. And so it's telling me that it was expecting an int, but it got 10 minutes. So you might want to change that. Uh, and when I've got an empty stage that doesn't have any steps in it, uh, I, it's reporting that there's nothing to execute within that stage and saying that's, that doesn't fit into the syntax, that's not allowed. You've got to actually have something to do in a stage. And so it's giving me a useful error message, pointing at what went wrong, giving me the line and column information, same as you'd get from a, a compilation error. I think that's really useful. Uh, now. You can do uh, this linting without actually having to run uh, the build. Uh, the way that I recommend is using the uh, Jenkins SSH CLI, uh, in which case you need your Jenkins administrator to open an SSH port and need to make sure you have creds, but that's just, we'll ignore that for the moment. You SSH into uh, the master, call the declarative, declarative linter command, and pipe in the Jenkins file, and it will give you the same results, uh, the same messaging uh, that you got when you run it in your build. Again, it'll tell you if it's successful, it'll tell you if it failed, and if it failed, it'll tell you where it failed and why it failed. You can also do that via the REST API uh, with curl. The curl command is a little ugly because I made sure we're actually using Jenkins crumbs because you're, you really should have uh, crumb protection enabled so on your master. Uh, it's a good security tip. Uh, and we've got plans for, um, I'm sorry, yes? Uh, the question was whether you could uh, validate scripted pipelines using this as well. No. Uh, that's, we, we would still like to eventually be able to do validation and linting for scripted pipelines, but it's a lot harder problem than doing it for declarative. That's part of why we wrote declarative. Uh, is giving a, with this, this structure and the predictability, we, can, uh, we don't have to worry about things like, oh, what type is that? Well, what, you know, that, that random class, what is that, et cetera. We actually know what all the possibilities are and can better uh, uh, analyze what could go wrong. But 
So for, for the foreseeable future, no, we will not have validation of scripted pipelines. Uh, we do have plans to have a uh, more flexible offline uh, validator that doesn't require you to SSH into Jenkins to do it. That's not around yet, but that is on our roadmap. Uh, as well as uh, GDSL for IntelliJ and other uh, things to make the development and testing of your pipelines, of your declarative pipelines easier. We'll see where that goes. And like I've said, this is just 1.0. Uh, so it's, we'll see where we end up taking things further. I just want to mainly focus on what we've already got for you. Uh, who here's heard of Blue Ocean? If you haven't, you should check it out. It's like pretty, especially by Jenkins standards. I mean, by Jenkins standards, it's gorgeous. I, I say this as somebody who loves the traditional Jenkins UI because I've lived in it for nine years, but. So I'm not gonna talk that much about Blue Ocean here because I am not a UI person. But uh, I did wanna just mention uh, a couple things that are declarative specific in Blue Ocean, uh, or de related to declarative in Blue Ocean. Uh, that we've got some special smarts on both sides for optimized visualization, such as uh, operations inside declarative like the SCM checkout, like Docker uh, image prep or uh, building uh, the, contain the image for the container, uh, post build actions, things that are not specified inside your actual stages block, but that still actually take time in your build. Uh, they get marked with special behind the scenes synthetic stages so that declarative, so that uh, Blue Ocean knows it doesn't have to put those in the main UI because you're not really, con as long as those don't fail, you're not really concerned with uh, seeing that in your visualization. That's just the cost of doing business. You know that there's gonna be a little time for your checkout, there's gonna be a little time for your uh, Docker image prep, et cetera. You don't need to have your, uh, you know, your graph of uh, stages necessarily include those. And as I also mentioned, that we've got special marking of stages that have been skipped due to either an unsatisfied when condition or a failure in an earlier stage so that those will show up differently in uh, Blue Ocean so that you'll be able to see, okay, yeah, this stage uh, didn't run because there was a when condition that was not met. So it, it'll be, I, I think it's gray, but don't quote me. Uh, but so you, you won't have, you'll, you'll, every single build you run will show in Blue Ocean, it'll show every stage that's in the execution model, even if they didn't run that time. So that even if the build failed on the first stage, it'll still mark that the second, third, and fourth stages existed. It's just they won't have done anything and they'll be displayed in a special way so that you can see that they were just skipped. Uh, now, just a little teaser on the editor. Uh, like I said, the editor will go into beta uh, on Monday. Um, it's still not, uh, not quite done. Uh, it doesn't yet do the round tripping of uh, being able to read a Jenkins file from your Git repo and then write the changed Jenkins file to the Git repo. That's in the works. It will happen before it goes 1.0. But I wanted to show you a little bit of what the UI looks like. Uh, pretty. Uh, again, it's, it's, like, it's like a visual editor. It's, um, so you can specify uh, your stages. You can uh, specify parallel execution by clicking that plus there, and then you can see here we've got in our test stage that we're executing both on Chrome and on Firefox and also on Internet Explorer. Uh, and then we get our deploy stage there. So uh, that's just the basic graph that you'll end up getting. It looks a lot, okay, almost identical to what you see for the, the run visualization uh, in Blue Ocean. Not a surprise. Uh, it's part of the Blue Ocean UI theme. Now, uh, here we're specifying a shell script to run, a shell step to run inside the Chrome parallel chunk. So it's just standard, put in some shell, it will run. Uh, and it is able to do the validation in real time so that when we use print messaging or echo and we don't require, put in a parameter for it, uh, it's saying, wait, no, that's, that's not valid. You need a parameter. You can't run that without a parameter. And it's giving you that, that validation 
right away through the editor without having to even wait to run a linting against it or run it in Jenkins, uh, which we think is going to be really handy uh, so that, especially for when you're getting started, but also I still use the freestyle editor just like, oh, I just need to do something quick, bam, bam, bam. Okay, it, right, it works. Uh, and again, it's we've been designing declarative with the editor in mind since day zero. Uh, we've made sure that conversion between the the syntax that the is internal to the editor and the syntax that it actually runs in Jenkins, that that conversion is seamless. Uh, we've got innumerable tests making sure of that. Uh, we've made sure the data model makes sense for the editor. It, it's We very, very much want to make sure the editor is a good, usable tool for you with declarative pipelines. And uh, that it can help uh, well, kill freestyle. Because um, with, the, with the editor, I, I personally feel that we're getting to the point where freestyle doesn't offer anything that you can't do better in pipelines, either in declarative for most cases and scripted for the more complicated cases. Now, I'm sure I'm wrong. I'm sure there are things I'm missing, but we'll get those too. Uh, and so, yeah, Monday, uh, the beta comes out. Uh, not sure how long it'll take to get to 1.0, but it, I expect it will be this spring. Uh, and we're looking forward to you giving it a try and giving feedback and seeing what's horrible and what's wonderful. So uh, what is the 1.0 release? Uh, I just want to wrap up with that since, you know, that's why I'm here. Uh, 1.0 came out uh, Wednesday of last week. It's in the Update Center. Uh, we... Uh, We'll be very, very, very careful not to make any breaking backwards compatibility changes. If we do, that's a bug and we will undo it. Uh, but I think our tests are uh, uh, comprehensive enough that that's not going to happen by accident. And I won't merge anything that does that either. Uh, it's important to note that declarative does require Jenkins 271 or later. It's the first LTS line of Jenkins 2. Uh, Blue Ocean has the same requirement. Uh, who here is running Jenkins 2? And who here is running Jenkins 1x? It's a good time to upgrade. Two seven, the, <laughs> that, that, I'm, not be, I'm not entirely being facetious. A little, but not entirely. Uh, I think the, two, the, the Jenkins 2 line is beyond uh, mature at this point. I think it's worth the upgrade. I think that the improvements that it has over the 1x line for usability and uh, UI are worth it. And if you want new stuff, you kind of got to go to two. So <laughs> um, there are blog posts coming up, uh, and one already up on Jenkins.io, introducing declarative. There'll be more detailed blog posts on some specific <laughs> aspects, like the syntax checking or the Docker integration. Uh, this talk, obviously, is part of the 1.0 launch. Uh, we're doing a Jenkins online meetup on Wednesday, February 15th, talking in more detail about declarative uh, with more information, uh, more, more deeper demo dives, uh, and some talk about the editor as well. And there is, by I think most open source standards, and especially by Jenkins standards, an immense amount of documentation up on Jenkins.io. Uh, thank you, Tyler. Uh, and we, uh, it, it's now when you go to the pipeline documentation, what? Uh, when you go to the pipeline documentation on Jenkins.io, it starts showing you declarative. You can switch over to see the scripted, but our, our plan going forward is that the default way you start is with declarative. And so we want to make sure it's documented, it's accessible, it's understandable. Uh, and... Uh, if you find flaws in the documentation or things that could be improved, pull requests are very much welcome, uh, as are bug reports if you don't actually want to you know, fix the docs yourself. Um, so resources, like I said, the main one is Jenkins.io slash doc. That's the canonical place, the definitive place, the right place to go to find documentation on declarative and on scripted pipelines and pretty much anything else that Tyler actually gets around to writing about Jenkins. Um, I think that 
Tyler and his team have done an amazing job with the Jenkins IO docs, and uh, I think it's uh, it's something we're proud of, and that I think is really useful. So uh, don't be afraid to give it a look. Uh, amusingly, the examples actually uh, pull requests actually didn't land yet, so we'll work on that. Uh, but I think that there's enough examples in the documentation that you'll be okay for now. And if you really are curious, you can find the source uh, for the plugin uh, on GitHub and Pipeline Model Definition plugin. Don't ask about the name. You never have to think about that. If you're on Jenkins 271 or later, if you just update the uh, pipeline aggregator that pulls in all the other plugins, this gets pulled in with it. So you don't have to jump through hoops to install it. But in case you wanted to see the source, I always feel the need to link it. And we have reference cards. Has anybody already picked up a reference card from the Jenkins booth? All right, well, I've got some more up here. Yeah. And they're also available online, and uh, we're pretty happy with them. Uh, and yeah, printed material. And that's pretty much it. So let's, we got about uh, four minutes for questions. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Do you plan to support any stages in parallel because you would like to uh, have the Docker agents as a broadcaster, but currently you can do that with ERP in parallel? The question was, uh, do we have plans to support uh, stages in parallel? So right now you can use parallel. Uh, but it doesn't, but then you have to specify your nodes, et cetera, within that. It's, 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 it's ugly, it's a little awkward. So the answer to your question is yes. I have a pending uh, post 1.0 uh, work in progress pull request doing exactly that to give you the ability to say, here's a bunch of stages to run in parallel. Uh, we're still working on exactly what the syntax will be, uh, exactly how the execution works, but parallel stage execution will be in within the next six weeks or so would be my guess. Uh, we consider that a requirement. There are some things that Blue Ocean needs to do for better visualization of that, so I need to bug them. But uh, that is, we consider that a requirement. We wanted to have that for 1.0, but we wanted to make sure that we uh, focused on uh, getting what we had really solid before uh, adding that feature. But it will be there soon, I promise. Yes? So the question was, can uh, one stage declare what is going to run, which stage is going to run next, and what steps are going to run in that stage? So the the stage execution order is the lexical order. It's the order that it's specified in the uh, the Jenkins file. I have played around with being able to say this stage can't run until these other stages are done, or this stage. When this stage finishes, this other stage kicks off. But I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find a good syntax for that that actually makes sense. Uh, so for now, the, the, it's just what's next in line. Uh, but we'll see. That's an area I'm definitely interested in, creating more of an um, execution dependency graph. Uh, but I need to figure out what the right way to do that is. And if I can't find the right way, I'm not going to do it. We're not going to, it's, impo it's really important to us that declarative continue to make sense and provide the uh, uh, both simplicity and power. Uh, so if we have to make a compromise uh, between full power and full uh, understandability and usability in declarative, we're going to go with usability. Because you can always switch to using a scripted pipeline when you need more power. Yes. Is there any way to enforce declarative? Right now, no. There are some ideas. Uh, I would expect that if uh, that it could be something from CloudBees that would require that, but right now there is not a way to enforce requiring declarative for everything. Uh, yes. Uh, so you, I imagine if declarative is a subset, if we need the power of a scripted pipeline, but want to. Yes. Yeah. The question was uh, whether there's a way to get some of the power of full scripted pipeline without having to completely leave declarative pipeline. Uh, there's a special step that's available called script. It's just script curly brace 
steps. And if it's inside, anything that's inside that script block doesn't go through validation, so we're not checking it to make sure it fits the syntax, subset of the syntax we allow. We're not uh, making sure that the step parameters are valid. We're allowing you to do if, else, for, et cetera, things that we don't allow you to do.